huge debate actually in the in the public sphere and if the if the outspoken people on pub, on social media are <laughs> to be representative of the two tie the two sides of of that debate we have people who argue that the uh the social costs to lockdowns and control methods to minimize the impact of COVID-19 of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that it's not worth the loss of life on the other side. And there are other people who say this virus is, you know, it's it's 10 times worse than, this, than the flu. Yeah, yeah. So we should be doing all these things. Where should we be talking about this controversy? Well, you know, this is where there's a tremendous amount of confusion and misinformation. Um, let me just take a step back and say that uh, pretty much the whole world was a house on fire uh, in March and April into early May. If you look at the European countries, look at the Lombardy region of Italy, you know, look at uh, Paris, look at uh, London. I go through all the various areas that were uh, heavily hit, as were uh, the Asian countries. And what they did, as, and as we attempted to do, was lockdown, a term that is a loose fitting term to a whole lot of different activities, but is it doing anything to restrict people's contact with other people, really? And those countries that really locked down off, didn't complete that activity uh, in terms of driving the virus levels down till well into June, early July. But many of those countries got their virus activity to less than one new case per 100,000 population per day. We, on the other hand, locked down about the same time, but we really didn't. In our own state of Minnesota, where we estimate that about 37% of our population are classified as essential workers, almost 75% were designated by the governor as being essential workers. So we really didn't shut down the economy all that much here. Okay, so then what happened was, uh, you know, we got to Memorial Day and we had gone from a high of 32,000 cases, house on fire, to 22,000 cases a day. And we said, well, we're done. Pandemic fatigue set in, you know, the protests were occurring. It was uh, the summertime, we wanted to all be together. And suddenly we saw what happened. We went from 22,000 cases to now 67,000 cases a day, which far dwarfed the whole number of cases we were having in April when we seemed like we couldn't get any worse. And then during that time period, you know, again, we, uh, Texas, Georgia, Florida, uh, you know, uh, Arizona. Arizona, all yeah. basically started the numbers coming down because of the fact that there was so much attention. You know, in Florida, up to a third of the ICUs were overfilled with patients, uh, et cetera. But then again, it, we brought it down, but now we're at the, uh, this today, we're gonna be at the low 40s. 40,000 cases today, 1,000 deaths. And yet that's 8,000 more cases than we had in April when we were a house on fire, but we've kind of accepted it. And I'll tell you right now, the case number is going to go up substantially again in the fall, likely far surpassing 65, 60,000 cases. So on a, in a Northern Hemisphere slash high income country basis, we're still not doing well at all. We're going to see a lot of cases and we're not prepared for that at all. We already are seeing a N95 shortage here in North America again. Right here, um, we have hospitals in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul that have less than five days of gloves on hand right now. Uh, even with this somewhat quote unquote stall in cases as it's been described by some. And so I, I think we are still really challenged to respond when these cases come back. And even though ICU care will be better, we still have every reason to believe we could threaten, substantially threaten ICU care availability. And let me just add one other point to that. One of the things we haven't talked about, but will ultimately be, uh, I think, well de determined, is that when we look at places that are on fire, whether they are the you know states like California, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, uh, whether we look at what happened in New York, there are real opportunity costs that occur with taking these hospitals over as COVID hospitals. And when you look at the mortality data from several of these locations, particularly New York, it was clear that a lot of extra people were dying, not just of COVID, but because of COVID, things. meaning yeah. that heart attack victims, stroke patients, uh, people who had other major health problems couldn't get in or refused to go into a hospital because of the fear of COVID, and they died at home. 
And yeah. so you, it, when ultimately we're going to have the direct mortality and we're going to have the indirect mortality. Now, and again, you get to middle and low income countries, they're not going to have the care, they're not going to have the PPE. Uh, if we think we have a problem with PPE right now, personal protective equipment, I can tell you there's much worse there. And so um, we are going into this next phase of this pandemic. And I wish I could say that we had done a much better job preparing. We haven't. It's a real challenge. Okay. So on, on that note, everyone be ready to stay home. <laughs> Limit well, you know, contract. it's not so much, yeah, you know, I think him and, and I didn't really answer the question. I, it's not about staying home. Uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Neil Kashkari, who is the uh, president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, and I had an op-ed piece in the New York Times, in which we basically called for another lockdown. But this yeah, time okay. on a regional basis or where it was necessary, New York doesn't need it right now, it doesn't. Right. And everybody said, oh my God, we can't do this. How can you say this? But ours came with a full, full uh, financial reimbursement for loss, whether it's wages, uh, small, uh, medium-sized businesses, uh, restaurants, bars, cities, counties. It turns out that our savings rate in this country has gone from 8% to 22% over the course of this pandemic. We could finance all of this debt out of U.S. dollars paying back interest to U.S. residents. And, and the Federal Reserve has actually uh, modeled this and said, you know, the, the uh, in, you know, economy is going to do much, much better if we get it, get done and move on and bring this under control and then get people back into public spaces, not afraid to be there, getting schools open. But if we keep dragging it out like this, where we're now at, you know, 40, 50,000 cases a day, people are, and particularly those who are older, at least, afraid to go back into public places. Uh, we're not being functional. We're going to have a hard time keeping schools open. And, and so our whole point was held everyone harmless. Financially, you should be covered. No one should take a hit. Uh, and number two is the fact that what we can do by getting the numbers way down, we can open up. Look at New York. New York has been a model. I, don't, I know that New York City in, is not back to where it once was. Everybody knows that. We're just now opening restaurants back to 25%. But they have been flat lined for the last yeah. 14 weeks. They've gone days with no deaths in the whole state. And they have done it really, really well to try to get us to that point one day of having vaccine without destroying the economy, but at the same time, not having to live with a 24-7 sirens in your ear uh, because of what was happening in the community. 